Uh, terrific. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So, as we've seen many times over the last three days, often the catalyst, the spark that lights the fire of innovation that we've been talking about, is philanthropy. Some would rather wait to see what might emerge, what could be learned from the risks taken by others. There is one organization at the forefront of innovation, bringing the future of healthcare closer to more people, forever changing the world around us. The team at Sanford Health is transforming the way the world looks at medicine and doing it on an unprecedented scale. They are integrating precision medicine into primary care with their unique Sanford Imaginetics program and making revolutionary breakthroughs in the fight against cancer and type 1 diabetes. Sanford Health has gone where no one else has to bring life-saving medicine and care to an African nation that has become the definitive institution for the health needs of the smallest patients. Pushing the Sanford Health Organization to go further, faster, and imagining how to accomplish things differently is the president and CEO of Sanford Health, Kelby Krabenhoft. <laughs> Nearly a decade ago, Sanford Health and Denny Sanford imagined a world different from the one around them, one that could not only be achieved, but also have a tangible impact on generations to come. Mr. Sanford's transformational gift gave Sanford Health the financial resources it needed, not to just reshape healthcare, but to do so as quickly as humanly possible. They initiated the Sanford Project with the mission to find a cure for type 1 diabetes. Through this translational research center, a collaboration was made with some of the world's foremost diabetes experts to develop a therapy that helps the body restore its natural insulin producing order and eradicating this disease once and for all. Sanford Health also had a calling to deliver care globally to those who needed it most. Working with the governments in Ghana and China, Sanford's World Clinics program saw more than 180,000 children and families in 2015 alone. Sanford's revolutionary biobank program finds subtle, hidden patterns in diseases that can rapidly translate into clinical care. Sanford Health is invested in the finest medical minds, cutting edge technologies, and superior facilities to create a meaningful impact around the globe. This organization is committed to its vision to improve the human condition through exceptional care, innovation, and discovery. Terrific. Uh, before we start and I introduce our esteemed philanthropist, I, I want to thank Pope Francis for making sure that video played correctly. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, uh, don't forget to try the veal, we're here all week. Um, now I would like to introduce our esteemed philanthropist to share with us their strategy in catalyzing this paradigm shift in medicine that we've been talking about. And first, we're to my far right, Dr. Ed Bosarge, president of the Bosarge Family Foundation. To my right, to, next to me, is Mr. Sean Parker, president of the Parker Foundation and founder of the Parker Institute. To my left, Mr. Denny Sanford, chairman and CEO of United National Corporation and healthcare philanthropist. And then Mr. Kelby Krabinoff, president and chief executive officer of Sanford Health. Each of our gentlemen here said they'd like to start out with a little brief uh, statement. And Ed, why don't we start with you, please? Thank you, Mac. 
Well, I'm, I've been singularly focused for quite a few yes, years sir. here yeah. on the issue of changing the regulatory environment to allow the regulations to catch up with where the science is throughout the United States. So as we've seen from some of the panels today, uh, we have, have noticed that there's a, there's a huge gap between where the regulation is in the United States and where the science is. And that gap doesn't exist in Japan. It doesn't exist in Europe. So I'm uh, focused a lot in the philanthropy in building a runway in the United States and putting the lights up to bring in these therapies and applications into the United States that already exist in the science domain, already exist in the safety domain in various parts of the world. So that's been my primary focus. Terrific, thank you. <laughs> Kelby, you represent a somewhat different uh, uh, point of view here in that you actually run a health system delivering health care. Tell us about your point of view there. Well, that's uh, the only place we can really credibly start from. And people come to us every day across the largest expanse in the United States of connected health care geographically, some 300,000 square miles. So as we listen to research, and as I talked to Denny before he made his uh, historical gift and investment in Sanford Health, it was about what we could get done and how we could apply health care on a daily basis to people who come to us um, sick and firm, scared and uh, injured. And that's what we uh, emphasize in all of our research. And it really has, has been our calling from the very beginning to see if we can take what great people can create at the bench and apply it at the bedside. Thank you. And Denny, you've really kind of enabled what, what uh, Kelby's been able to do. Thank you. Uh, first off, I want to thank the Vatican for providing the, the impetus for the, this whole program. Robin Smith and your organization, thank you. I mean, this has been a wonderful, wonderful conference and assembly. Simply put, I look at life through... <laughs> Simply put, I look through light through the lens of an investor. I look at philanthropy as, a, as an investment, if you will. And I look for a high return on investment as I get into the various businesses that I'm, I'm enjoying. Uh, the approach has helped me build successful businesses, and it's now time to I use the same approach in the area of, of philanthropy, particularly in the, in the world of medicine and education. I consider opportunities for my investment based upon what potential return that they have. And I want my resources to obviously do the, the maximum benefit and cure the problems that we've talked about here all week, this week. What a great conference. This approach has led my <coughs> investments in the Sanford Health and our work together on several big initiatives, several. Part of life as an investor is to be smart about the team you invest in and I've been fortunate to find a great, effective partner in Kelby and in Sanford Health. Uh, I've joked that Kelby is, and I know he is, the best pickpocket in, <laughs> in this room, if not in the world. <laughs> he, he's a master at pick, picking my pocket. Uh, in reality, he and his team present me with innovative ideas and aggressive goals, and they are far exceeding their their, their whole plan. He is a visionary of huge note. I want to thank the, the organizers, but, but primarily thank Sanford Health for providing what they have done. I know firsthand the impact of stem cells can have, as I'm a stem cell recipient myself. Uh, last, I, last August, I had a full knee replacement. It was the most painful thing I've ever been, been through. And not, not only the operation itself, but an, an additional four or five months of, of rehab with it, and it was not fun. So I got smart, talked to Kilby and, and Dr. Alt, who I hope is still here, uh, and went to Munich, Germany, to Sanford International operation over there, and had the knee done uh, with stem cells. And the results so far are looking very, very good. Uh, the majority of the pain is gone, and, 
and hopefully those little guys are growing and, and regenerating. <laughs> <laughs> As we all know, that based upon discussions over the last three days, stem cells really hold the promise to greater impact patients and cure diseases. To me, I, I refer to it as the medicine of the future. That's what it is. Stem cells are providing solutions to unanswered problems, and philanthropy provides the vehicle to rapidly accelerate the pace of that discovery. Finally, I thank you again all, and congratulate all the participants here, not only the uh, speakers, but all of the, the attendees for being here for such a momentous occasion. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> I, by the way, Kelby's actually a doctor. What he performed on you is called a walletectomy. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, Sean, tell me, you've given away a lot of money already and made a big bet even more recently on this. Tell me about why. What's going on there? So, I mean, I'll, I want to double down on something <clears throat> that Denny said, which is essentially a point about leverage. Um, and, and it, you know, something that you experience whenever you're, you're going from being entrepreneurial uh, or being in the business world, where there's a clear uh, return on investment that's measurable, to going into philanthropy where all of a sudden it becomes very difficult to, to measure the ROI on a lot of things. Um, and, and sometimes that can be really frustrating because as, as an entrepreneur, you're, you're accustomed to, to making, you know, relatively small investments and getting enormous returns. So, you know, many entrepreneurs, when they're starting to go into something like, uh, you know, life sciences um, philanthropy, which, you know, looked at, even, even when looked at as an investment, um, it, it doesn't change the fact that uh, it, it's sometimes hard to measure the return, and the time frame involved is, is such a longer time frame than that of being an entrepreneur where, you know, maybe there's, uh, you know, six to eight years to, to get to some sort of a liquidity event, um, which seems like a really long amount of time, but in, in the scheme of uh, cancer treatment, it actually turns out as a very short amount of time. So, so approaching this problem as an outsider and having, you know, having dabbled for uh, some number of uh, uh, roughly a decade in making smaller grants, um, I was constantly asking the question, you know, how do we get leverage? How do we, how do we, how do we get way more out of, of our giving than we put in? And, you know, I kept, I kept coming back to the idea of or the importance of building coalitions, the importance of collaboration, um, the import, importance of breaking down the structural barriers or the systemic barriers that are um, that are preventing change from happening faster. Because even even though um, it, there's something a little bit less satisfying about that than funding, you know, a very specific individual piece of research, uh, the the dividends uh, compound over a long period of time, uh, and and the the hope there is that you can actually um, not just create, you know, one individual uh, organization like the Parker Institute, which is focused on immunotherapy, but hopefully inspire other philanthropists, uh, you know, to, to build similar organizations, which gives you uh, an enormous amount of leverage above and beyond the actual gift itself. The idea that you can create a blueprint or a model that uh, previously maybe many people thought was not possible, uh, you know, in terms of the intellectual property sharing, the sort of common framework across multiple institutions that otherwise, you know, don't have a reputation for necessarily being the most collaborative institutions. Uh, and, and uh, you know, if you, can, if you can, you know, demonstrate that that's possible within, you know, perhaps one narrow area like immunotherapy, maybe, uh, maybe it can be done uh, elsewhere as well. So that brings up really the first question, Sean, is you've, you use the language of business there just talking about it. How important is it, do you feel, and it sounds like you are, of course, but how important do you feel it is to develop a business plan along with giving the money, with the philanthropy? How, how important is that to really make things happen? I mean, I, I think it's incredibly important, but it's also really hard uh, because the, the, the world of philanthropy is not necessarily um, immediately measurable. I mean, it, it is, it's, uh, and philanthropists don't, as much as we, we talk about the importance of uh, impact investing or measurability or, or you know, uh, sort of making, making philanthropy quantifiable, uh, 
you know, the, the last thing that, that large philanthropists want to be told is that their gift didn't work out or that it, it, wasn't, it wasn't successful or it wasn't leveraged properly. That's actually something that as a, as, as a philanthropist, no one ever tells me. So I actually have to try to hold myself accountable um, regularly, you know, to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that the gifts are being leveraged. And in order to do that, I think you, you, have to, you have to try to figure out a way to look at them as, as the way you would look at a business. Well, okay, that brings up something else. Ed, tell me, you know, in addition to how you determine where and how much to contribute to, to various uh, philanthropic initiatives, how do you measure success? I know you're a tough, tough-minded businessman. You're going to demand some way of measuring. What's the metric? How do you figure it out? Well, <clears throat> I think in, in our case, uh, my, my goals here uh, in terms of stem cell therapy, having been involved in it for quite a number of years in, in cancer research uh, and in MD Anderson, uh, most of those were philanthropic endeavors. But this paradigm shift from medicine as we know it to uh, the convergence of all the life sciences uh, over the next few years with this inflection point that uh, Joe Biden talked about. And I think uh, the measurement of move, the movement from medicine and the percentage of medicine that's taken place in a normal way and the percentage that's taken place with regenerative medicine with a tangible goal to say in 10 years we'd like 20% of all medicine done in a regenerative sense with stem cells. So that's a target that we would set out there to happen. And it's going to take a lot of philanthropy to get there because uh, we're going to have to change the system that we're operating in. <coughs> So we're not accepting the existing system because it, uh, it, it, it's not working in the United States like it, like it is in J Japan. We had the panel today. We saw how far Japan is ahead of the United States in terms of the environment that allows, it allows healing. It to happen. Uh, yeah. Danny, what do you do to, to measure it? What are your metrics? Or do you just say, Kelby, <laughs> make it happen? <laughs> one, one word, and that's milestones. Yep. Uh, we have to build in milestones, and I've insisted upon that with whatever organization I'm, I'm trying to support, and, and it works. You know, they have to be obviously agreeable to begin with, and, and I've never seen them not m meet the milestones that, uh, that they, uh, Sanford Health or any other organization that I, well, that I've invested in. They've got to be reasonable to a certain extent, yeah. right? right. <laughs> You've got to stretch. But right. Kelby, in research, it's a little tougher, perhaps, to, to measure and to have those milestones now, as opposed to in a healthcare delivery system? Well, there's a, a, a very significant commonality in your question to Sean and his response it, it, that indeed you have to use almost a business approach. A, a CEO brings a return on investment theory uh, to, the, to the table, but also then the, the prospects or the pro forma that would lead to success. Um, we had a promise, uh, and in our organization, a promise made is a promise kept, is a, is a common phrase, uh, probably more inspired by our relationship with Denny than anything else, because those promises are out there, and, and it, they're not immediately seen and uh, apparent to everyone. But we set milestones, as Sean said, while necessary, difficult. And in Denny's case, he said, I wanted to see this uh, cure for type 1 diabetes in my lifetime. Now, I'm real glad to think that Eckhart Alt and the rest are giving him stem cells, so he gives me a little more time. Um, <laughs> but, but that doesn't take the, uh, the burden off mine or our organization's back, uh, nor the warning. Uh, I think every single session that I've attended and listened from people speaking from these chairs down here was about what's taking so long. And every time I go into the Sistine Chapel, I think of Julius II asking, when is it going to be finished to Michelangelo? And he said, it'll be finished when it's done. And it's the same <laughs> answer I get now, you know. And <laughs> um, but I've got a group of, of spunky and focused and uh, unbelievably motivated people toward an endpoint. And as I said in my opening comments, it's about the delivery of that uh, at the bedside. We're the largest employer in two states. Um, we have 27,000 employees, a big insurance company. And so all the tools are there to take what is discovered by the great minds and the great laboratories and work here uh, and apply it 
in a way that an insurance benefit package can pay for it, in a way that doctors can apply it. There's 1,500 physicians, the fourth or fifth largest group of physicians under one roof uh, in America. And so that communication linkage, that incentive and opportunity is all right in front of us, and really that all took off when I met Denny Sanford, that infrastructure. So in a way, you're lucky because you've got a shorter translational path from benchtop to bedside. You can, you can actually do it yourself. And that's what makes the, uh, the excuses very lame and the <laughs> accountability very high. <laughs> so far, you're doing okay. You still got your job, right? <laughs> so far. So, Sean, you know, what addition, I mean, you've seen and heard over the last couple of days a lot of stuff going on, and we've identified a number of obstacles that have to be overcome, areas where things are working well. What additional initiatives do you feel we need here to really move the field, particularly cellular therapy, to move that forward? <clears throat> well, I mean, I, 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 think that, I think that the model, um, the sort of the coalition or the large collaborative model um, needs to be expanded uh, to as many different mm -hmm. disease groups as possible, uh, needs to be tried uh, in, in, in all kinds of places where, um, where maybe progress isn't happening as fast as, as, fast as it should be. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, thematically there's a lot of things from a regulatory perspective, a government perspective that, that could be done. Um, you know, I think, I think we need, you know, one, one, of, one of the next logical step beyond the Human Genome Project is, is uh, you know, sequencing whatever, whatever it ends up being, several million, uh, you know, complete sequences, and then having lots of phenotype information associated with that uh, across a huge range of different diseases and a huge range of different outcomes and a huge range of different, uh, you know, phenotype char characteristics. Um, and that needs to be a public good. So I'm not sure if that's if that's a database that a, a, a private company or a coalition of philanthropists or potentially the NIH, so, but so, somehow somehow that um, that needs to that needs to happen. And there's probably a role for government to play in doing that. And there's a, probably uh, a role for um, the private se sector, in particular philanthropy, to play in in setting that up. Ed, uh, let me ask some that similar question to you, like because I know that you're you're really focused, obviously, on breaking down the regulatory uh, barriers. How do, we, how do we accomplish that? Is that lobbying? Is that going after uh, legislators, uh, getting the public to light a fire under, uh, under our regulators? How do we do that? Well, so far, um, it's been guerrilla warfare, <laughs> one senator at a time, one congressman at a time, talking about the benefits of this and then various advocacy programs. We brought in a lot of partners into this. And uh, this transformation is a policy transformation where we have to move from the kind of medicine we've been doing to regenerative medicine, where we're looking to the body to be able to heal uh, with the cells that God put inside the body as reserve stem cells. So it's been our theme here for three years. And I think it's, uh, uh, the, the money, the philanthropy you got to put up is driving policy change and just uh, making sure that you get the regulate, you, you get the actual legislators involved on a personal basis. And I can tell you just about every senator in the Senate, you'll meet with them and they'll, they'll, they'll have an orthopedic problem. They will have a mother that can't walk they will have a situation that needs immediate attention for which there's no solution. So get them personally involved. So I spent a lot of time in Washington, spent a lot of money get, getting the, the access working, and it's, it's working well, and we've got a lot of good partners in this room that are helping in a philanthropic way in this, in this drive. And I learned that a long time ago in television. You have to put a face on the science in order for people to, to really respond to it. And that, it sounds like that's what that's you're right. doing. That's right. You've got to make individual. it very personal, Absolutely. very personal, what their needs are. And there's a solution in stem cells available that's being done in Munich, Barcelona, Tokyo. It's like to be done mm -hmm. in Houston or San Francisco 
LA. By the way, it looks to me like we've got at least a couple of hundred lobbyists right here who've <laughs> all got congressmen, you've all got senators. Absolutely. If, if you believe, make sure you let them know what you believe and what you want them to do. We've got, we've got our Johnny Appleseeds or, 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 or our, our lobbyists right in front of us. <laughs> Danny, we heard where, where you've put your money. How did you decide that? And this is what always kind of interests me is how you decide where you're going to put your money and, and what's the project that you're going to put it behind. Well, the starting point is always trust and respect. I mean, you no know, two words tell, tell us the story of life more than trust and respect. Once you trust someone and respect them, uh, you can go with them. And you obviously have to know them well and, and understand them and their motives and your motives need to, need to you know, not collide, but rather be uh, harmonious mm -hmm. together. And uh, that that's really the, the most simple uh, way I can explain it. Uh, when when I can trust someone and believe in them and they have the, uh, the expertise, the willpower, as well as the manpower to get the job done, mm -hmm. uh, I make my bet. But you had a, a lot of different diseases you could have put your, your money into, right? And you put a lot of money behind Type 1 diabetes. Uh, that was, Any personal reason? Uh, no, no personal reasons. Uh, some, some of my personal reason. I lost a dear friend at age 43, mm -hmm. had lost his feet, lost his eyesight, and lost his, his life. But uh, the primary consideration there was Kelby and I went to the Battelle Institute and asked them to define as best they could a disease that is curable in my lifetime and I'm running on a runway. <laughs> <laughs> and they came back with type 1 diabetes. Yeah. And, and we really believe a lot of initiatives that we have, we think we're really close. Yeah. I think so too. But Kelby, how did you, how did you pick type 1 diabetes and, and then was it a tough sell? Um, actually, we, uh, this is going to sound uh, contrived, but it's the absolute truth. The, the Catholic Church uh, created councils in its, uh, in its history to resolve great questions facing it. So I told Denny the, the best way between the great diseases of, uh, that are challenging humankind would be to us to talk to Battelle, organize a process that would last about a year, bring the best researchers from across the globe, some are here, uh, that were part of that process, and have them convene a council and debate and discuss who, which disease was best funded, which was almost practice ready, what had the best academic and, and historically classic research applied to it to really render it vulnerable to a cure. And we found ourselves close. But as Denny and I talked and as the panel's about philanthropy, I've, I didn't want to miss the chance to say, when a, when a gentleman like this shows up and first is inspired by a children's hospital that I think you saw in the video. And thank God that made it all the way through because I'm the curse of all technology. That's why it went down twice. But the, um, to, to begin with a children's hospital and deliver on a promise and then start talking about another gift of 400 million, along the way, our board of trustees, all of whom are here now um, in this room, had a concern that that would dry up the well. Everyone else would be afraid. But in fact, uh, that's a misnomer. It, it became the magic of momentum. Immediately upon the announcement of that gift, another family stood forward, all suffering from type 1 diabetes, and gave us a $10 million gift simply to fund the chair so that annually someone like Dr. Alt would have the funds to come and lead the organization through the process of type 1. And that's happened over and over. And I know collaboration is on the minds of philanthropists. It's, uh, I, I know it's on the minds of researchers here. But I think it's playing out even in the seats that are in front of you today because uh, how would I ever know Ed Bosarge if it wasn't for Dave Bocherny and, how, and then uh, Robin Smith? And that's how we got here. That collaboration is going on at the philanthropic level at the same time that it's going on uh, in data and in research uh, across the globe. Which actually brings me to a question that I wanted to ask Sean. Is there a, a snowball effect that by you giving money, by Ed, by Denny giving money, that you can then bring other philanthropists along? They, they see where you're putting your money. Hopefully they'll see some of the uh, results that we're going to get and that we've already talked about. 
have you felt any of that? Is there a, that snowball effect? <clears throat> well, I, I, mean, I certainly hope. I certainly hope so. Um, I, you know, I, I, th I think that uh, you know the reason that the reason you do events like this and the reason you talk about I mean, the real, th there's no reason to talk about your giving. Uh, or to talk about philanthropy in general, unless unless the goal is to inspire other people to also participate and to, to, to get involved and to give more, mm. uh, to create that that uh, you know virtuous circle um, of of inspiration and giving that leads to you know more giving and faster success. So you know you know I think if the, you know the the purpose of what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Is to share, you know, whatever whatever sort of small insights we've had from both success and failure uh, in this space, and 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 hopefully and hopefully other people can you know can can take what they will from that and 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 potentially jump on the bandwagon and and, and do similar things. Well, let's hope so. And you know, because Ed, you were you were early into you were an early adopter, as it were, of giving money to promote and support cell cellular therapy. Yes. Yes. I, I feel I better think, now. Uh, we've got, we've got some others on board. <laughs> the stage feels better than, than it did the first year. Right? <laughs> no, uh, Rob, Robin and I had uh, the first year, 2011 here, it was uh, in this same room. It was a, it was a lonelier battle to get, to get it all put together. But after I'd seen Robin's performance, tactical, structural, everything, and, and the way the Vatican supported us, uh, I was willing to take on 2013, and uh, this year we started bringing in partners. So we invited Sanford Health in, and uh, Denny and uh, uh, Denny and uh, Kelby came over to over yonder key in the Exumas. We had a conference, and before you know it, we had most of the money raised. And then there's a lot of people in this room that decided to get on board because they see where this is going and have written $100,000 checks to make this happen. So we've collected um, uh, a lot of good spirit, and good, a lot of good people who, who believe in this. And this third conference, I think you will have to admit, is over the top. I mean, those of you who have been here three times, but this is pretty well over the top. Quality of the science, quality of the people, uh, the people who want to be uh, I want to join forces to make this a reality in cellular therapy. So it was largely cellular therapy the first two years, and bringing in cancer this year, Robin and I talked about that, and uh, the dramatic growth of, of progress, dramatic progress in immunotherapy, we decided to really emphasize that this year, and it played a you know, major role, because what that does is that brings in all of the life sciences converging in, in, in one spot, and so the Third day today, we focused more on some of the traditional bread and butter solutions of autologous therapy and, and using, using stem cells for an awful lot of things, including the anti-aging uh, work that we're doing. So Ed brought you on board. Who are you going to bring on board? Good question. Good question. Here's Let's talk about your here. health. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> Bring me on board. I, my, my bank account won't pay for much more than the bottle of water, but we, we, can, we can cover that. Sean, how about you? Got some ideas? You don't have to name names, but, you, you know, just bank accounts. <laughs> <laughs> the account numbers, that'll be good. Right. Uh, you know, there's a. There's but is that, that something, something, you, want to, is that good, something you want to do? Actually, I guess you know, look, 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 face, Facebook, Facebook made it. You know, made made a lot of investors a lot of money, and uh, you know, it's uh, so it may be time to cash in some of those favors. Good. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah, I'll get back to you on the specific <laughs> account numbers. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I didn't really mean to put you that much on the spot. Um, I'm actually passing you under the table right now. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, speaking of Facebook, is there a role for social media here to, to sort of help? We're, we're talking about big number philanthropy, but should we crowdsource some of this? Is that a, is that a doable way to, 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 to fund some of this, or is that just too diffuse and too hard to get people to get on board with? We could crowdsource the advocacy. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I look. I think I, I think I think that 
in, in fact, putting both of those ideas together, when, when uh, you know, psychologically, when you've opened your wallet and, and chosen to, to commit to something, even if it's a small amount of money, then you're more likely to, you know, con to follow through, to mm -hmm. give more money, uh, to hold your, your elected officials accountable for results. Uh, you know, it's about this kind of ladder of engagement that we talk mm -hmm. about in consumer internet. So, so I think, I think you know, even, even raising small amounts of money from, from a large number of people, uh, it is incredibly important because it's about getting that investment from, you know, getting getting individuals started early in giving, getting them invested in in the thing that they're most concerned about, and then and then you know continuing to leverage those relationships. Um, so social media is great uh, in 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 getting in getting you know, sort of sp spreading the word um, as broadly as possible, and and um, you know. Getting getting a camp campaign going so that um, you know so that it can spread virally, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, no one's quite cracked the code yet in terms of how how we can leverage social media. And we've tried to do it with causes on Facebook. You know, Change.org has been somewhat successful mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. advocacy and petition yeah. space, but no one's quite yet cracked the code in terms of how we leverage directly off of social media in order to you know raise large amounts of money concentrated towards one thing. But clearly, having having everyone have even if it's a small amount of skin in the game, really makes them feel like they're part of the solution in, in this case. And, and we need more yep. more people involved in the solution. Um, Kelby, I, pro I should have probably put this to you a little bit earlier because uh, being on the ground and much closer to to some of these uh, problems, are there other initiatives that you see that we should be pursuing? Well, the theme for this conference relative to regeneration, uh, I think, captures the imagination of every single person that hears about its potential. And I, I think we probably don't need to pivot yet uh, because we haven't exhausted the opportunity. This is, a, this is a frontier in medicine that is within all of us, rich and poor, and that can be applied to all of us rich and poor. We have uh, a thousand people a week coming into our clinics, uh, actually hundreds of thousands coming to the clinics, but a thousand a week are signing up for the biobank, giving us their own human material. And they're of all walks, all genders, all <laughs> colors, all everything. And that's that needs to be unlocked, a lot like what Sean was just saying, whether it's Wounded Warrior, Susan Coleman, what, whatever historical thing has been done in the past, for people to be aware of what potential is in this room, everyone in here just lights up is, as to the miraculous potential of it. And once that gets to the masses, and then once they decide to part with their treasure, small as it might be, or large as it might be, like people up here, it gets contagious, and that's a disease we don't want to stop, you know, the contagiousness of giving. And uh, Denny Sanford is approaching $800 million that he's given our organization alone. And, and yet we think all the time about how to attract uh, everyone to this battle and everyone to it, and so even the executives in the company. We've, we, most of us have signed over in our, in our estates and our, our planned giving. Uh, Heidi and I are giving a million dollars to the same initiatives. It's, and you know, I still got to put kids through college and all, all of that stuff. And it's um, it, it's contagious, and it's the right way to do it because once you know what's possible, you invest in it. Let me just ask you real quick uh, a little. <laughs> the biobank are these patients, or these are just people in general? And, and what what are what what kind of tissue are they leaving? Um, well, they are, we number one blood, and then and then anything that's convenient at the time. We, <laughs> we <laughs> uh, a swab of, of the inside of the mouth or or whatever. But also, um, uh, we have this. We're the largest um, manufacturer of of life uh, as it comes to be in in the Dakotas. Uh, through birth. Uh, uh, we're the largest uh, birthing centers in two states, and the, the notion for centuries, forever, of taking umbilical cords 
and everything else that's related to the birth and just throwing it in the trash can seems so absurd. And I've heard from the speakers here that we will be looked upon like we look at the Aztecs <laughs> um, someday. And when I think of what we're doing uh, in that regard, we put a halt to it. We put the policies in place, and within a year, we'll be, we'll be keeping everybody's umbilical cord from the moment they're born, and then, and then beyond that. So that's the kind of material that's just gonna yield for everyone their own bank account of, of human treasure, uh, and what we can do with it predictively, therapeutically, pharmaceutically into the future just seems, oh, what's taking so long, right? Yeah. Thank you. Denny, tell me, a lot of giving is is often accompanied by a, uh, personal branding, a lot of media and so forth. Is that a, a plus or a minus? Could, could more of that help philanthropy, do you think? Or you've been pretty low key about all of this. Um, should we, should you be a, a little more out there with it? I, I think it's good and bad. I, I love the term. A rising tide raises all ships. I mean, that says a lot, and, and it does. I, I know a lot of people, it, number one, it, it validates whatever Kelby's doing or whatever any other institution uh, that I support is doing. So, okay, it's, it has the validity of, of the whole consideration. Uh, going beyond that, uh, I, I think for the most part, you know, I've, I've been a little uh, concerned about too much media attention, so on and so forth, but at the end of the day, most people just realize it's, it's all well meant. Mm -hmm. it's, not for, mm -hmm. it's not for publicity. Not for self-aggrandizement. Right. Exactly. So yeah, Sean, it, you're sort of on the other end of that spectrum in the sense that a lot of people know you and you've gotten a lot of publicity out of this. Is that a positive in terms of being able to pull other people in? Get people to understand what, what, we're trying, what you're trying to do? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the point that I was uh, making making earlier that that you know the purpose of talking about philanthropy is to get other people interested in philanthropy. You know, I mean, there's no other reason to do it, um, and uh, uh, you know, it 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 actually, f f you know, I've had to I've had to weigh you know both sides of you know the both sides of this question in my mind for several years. I mean, it took about three years to negotiate the. Um, you know the deals that that led us to form the institute, um, and and during that period of time, I was um, really struggled with this question of even how to name the institute. I was very opposed to the idea of even putting my name in the gift at all. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, in part because the most important thing uh, in announcing it is that other people will jump on board and give as well. Uh, so we we did some interesting. We did some interesting things in terms of um, making sure that the the branding rights at all of the individual centers, um, you know, are not are not necessarily you know branded along with the institute. That the the brick and mortar structures that are built, the wet lab space that's built, the naming of each individual center, and the sites, um, you know, will be determined by other philanthropists. And and that once we'd sort of figured that piece of the model out, um, you know, I was a little bit more comfortable with with you know going forward with you know with with the launch and i ultimately came to the conclusion that you know to to make a 250 million dollar gift and then you know maybe because i'm i'm actually and i know it sounds kind of crazy but i'm usually you know given given how the public how public many of my endeavors have been but i'm actually relatively media shy and <laughs> and and have been systematically traumatized by my experiences with the media <laughs> So, so you know, as a, as, a, as a result of that, I'm very, I'm really hesitant to want to talk about anything publicly, um, let alone, let alone philanthropy, and and you know, so so I finally kind of came came to the conclusion that that I had an obligation, um, to to go you know carry out you know a, a, a public launch and, and discussion um, of the goals. Of, of the institute and the model for how all of these centers were going to collaborate with one another. Uh, because to, to not do that would be a missed opportunity and it actually felt like it would, you know, maybe, maybe be too much of an easy way out. Um, you know, the, the, the last uh, several months, once, once, look, once we get the thing up and running and patients are being treated and research is being done, you know, the last thing you want to do is then have to go on a media roadshow and explain it to everybody. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just sort of like like, like promoting a movie or something. Yeah, I, I mean, you just you you just you just want to sort of, you know. At least in my case, I'm going to get back to the science and continue um, working with, you know, working closely with with scientists and learning, which is the part that I find most interesting. Um, you know, and, and so it almost felt a little bit anticlimactic to go through this three-year process and then have to have this kind of public conversation about it. But it, it seemed like the right thing to do. And it's working. So, I mean, thank you, d despite the fact that I apparently and, and all my colleagues have been traumatizing you left and right for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow we always end up with me, the you know the whipping boys up here. No, no, no. I, 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 I blame I, I blame Scott Rudin and, uh, and and David Fincher and and, and those the folks in the movie yeah. business. So Ed, te you know when when you make um, an investment, if you will, um, and give a gift, particularly in something like basic research, which which you've done, you're never really sure how that's gonna how that's gonna turn out. So there there is a, a risk involved, that you're putting money into something that isn't going to, to pay off. Um, do you look for less risky uh, sort of things, which then almost by definition would have less of a payoff, or how do you de-risk your giving? I, 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 don't, I don't ever look at anything as de-risking and giving in philanthropy. You either feel it, and it feels right, and then you do it, and you put all your efforts into it and drive the ship. And make sure it goes forward in the in, in the right way. Now, I, I, I agree with Sean. I, I would be a lot happier to put this uh, cellular pathway through the legislative process, have everybody shake hands, Democrats, Republicans agree, and want our pathway so I could get back to the science. But meanwhile, um, I'm not doing as much science now as I would like. So I'm I'm doing the part that I have to do to make sure this philanthropy pays off and we actually get legislation in the United States. I think you've got to, you know, you've got to go public. You've got to tell people who you are and why you're supporting this. And, and that's what brings everyone else on, on board. Are you going to do that for us? Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, for sure. A man of few words. <laughs> Kelby, tell me, let's see, we talked about, we talked about initiatives. What else do you want to see? happen. You're doing, you're delivering the health care. You've got type 1 diabetes. You went through a, a, a long thing. Not necessarily for you and, and for your health system uh, in Sanford Health and Sanford Research, but uh, sure. in general, what else do you think, where else do you think we need to be spending some money and, and, and really putting our resources and our brain power primarily? Well, I can get pretty personal pretty quick. My dad uh, suffered for 50 years uh, with retinitis pigmentosa and was blind. I drove him to work every day and he taught microbiology. And my brother Paul fell out of a tree when he was 12 years old, the best athlete in the family, and never walked again. And I was the first one at the bottom of the tree to talk to him. And uh, it seems to me that it's taken now 58 years for me to sit in a room with people who are saying that those two things don't have to be part of another generation, and that gets awfully personal. And that, that's what I'd like to see. I had dinner the other night in the presence of somebody that just humbles me, and he's sitting right in front of me, Cardinal Ravasi, and he told the story about Messinas, who gave his wealth to this city eight years before Christ was born. And who could have had the vision of what Rome has become, and that it, the recipient the donor ended up giving it to the most impressive inst religious institution in the world. Likewise, I'm sitting next to somebody who's my Messinas, and I think people will remember him, uh, along with the discoveries and things that are being done and talked about in this room. And that is just as important that Cardinal Ravasi can refer back to Messinas, and I can refer back to Denny Sanford, and the generations and thousands of years that come after this, people will talk about the guys seated to the right of me. And isn't it fun to see the different generations that are doing the same thing? I, uh, I think coming out of this, Max, I, want, I would hope the one thing I asked for at that dinner was the great memories, the great stories and histories, but the relationships in here are really going to yield something. They really are. It's not 
it's not a commercial. The, the talks we're having outside of your earshot are important <laughs> and they're fun and people are energized and want to see something done. So. I promise it's all off the record. And it's all off the record. <laughs> trust me. I'm, you know, I'm a reporter. You can trust me. <laughs> it's not that funny. Um, <laughs> Sean, this, it may or may not you know, directly relate to what we're talking about in terms of, of crowdfunding, but uh, it seems that, and I, and I talk to these people and interview many of these people all the time, as soon as someone has... Uh, a serious illness, a serious disease or something, they form a foundation. And it's generally very, very small and they're struggling for money. Uh, and I've often thought, is that the best way to fund research or should we encourage these smaller groups to somehow bond together so that they can reach some kind of a, a, a critical mass to really be able to push research forward? And, I mean, it's a, I don't know if there's any right answer, but what do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I, think, I think all forms of, all forms of giving are, are, are important. And, you know, what's, what's sort of remarkable about, I touched on this the other day, about immunotherapy was just how little funding it had received, at least in the last decade, and yet how much, how much incredible progress had been made off of, off of what is a relatively small amount of money compared to, you know, the you know, some estimates say that across pharma and government, as much as $100 billion a year may be going to cancer research. This is just an extraordinary number. We know that $5 billion a year just in NCI funding in the U.S. alone. So, so the, the, these relatively small uh, gifts can sometimes be incredibly transformational. And, and, and I think that's, that's – so you don't want to – we wouldn't want to do anything to, to stifle – uh, you, you know, the, the small, focused, entrepreneurial style of giving, which, which – in some ways, you know, may have, you know, in some cases may be inadequate to solve the problem, but in other cases that, that laser-like focus is actually exactly what's needed in order to make progress. Hmm. Let me ask, as we wrap up here, we've got just a few minutes left, uh, each of our panelists, um, for their wish list. What do you want to see happen? Uh, we like the, uh, let's pick, a five-year horizon, maybe, or a ten-year ten-year horizon. You can pick your own. What would you like to see happen in that relatively near future? Ed, tell me what what's on your wish list. Well, I I, I have this uh, goal of the transformation of the medical model. The, we typically say in the United States that uh, the medical model is broken, the healthcare system is broken. We hear a lot about that. And um, we've had various attempts at uh, medical <coughs> models, Obamacare, et cetera. So I, I really think that we have to rethink the problem. As Einstein said, you can never solve uh, a problem uh, that's defined in the same language that you, know, that you learned at the time the problem was defined. You've got to go outside the domain. And I think we've got to go outside the domain for this regenerative medicine model. So my answer would be, in 10 years, 50% of all medicine would have evolved to be treated with uh, the, the, the kind of therapies that we're talking about now that have come to convergence in the life sciences. You, you've got the cellular therapy model, you've got regenerative medicine, you've got uh, the genomics, and all of these areas are converging and you can feel it happening. And I think uh, we could see a dramatic change in medical cause, dramatic change in efficiency of our system, and dramatic change in dis distribution of care across the world to those who can afford it if we do this thing efficiently uh, in, with regenerative medicine and genetics and take advantage of all of these new technologies that are, that are out there. So I'd like to see that 50% of all medicine transformed and 10 years. Big wish list. Sean, yeah, we know where you put your money, but uh, what, do you, what do you hope comes out of all that? Well, <clears throat> you know, we, I think we, I, well, one thing we talk about pretty frequently is the idea that within the next 20 years, uh, we can make a, a, take a, make a big dent in the 50% of cancers that really are not uh, readily treatable uh, with, you know, standard of care today. Mm -hmm. 
um, and, and, and ultimately convert, uh, you know, cancer into a, most cancers into curable diseases or, or, or chronic diseases that are, that are readily treatable. Um, you know, it, in order to, in order to do that, I think, you know, immunotherapy is one really interesting technology platform that has a broad applicability. It's not the only one. Um, my, my hope is that more near term, uh, more people will consider uh, immu enrolling in trials in, uh, related to immunotherapy. They'll, they'll consider immunotherapy as uh, uh, in, an option and actually demand that their clinicians, you know, give them immunotherapies, whether it be checkpoint blockade or cell therapies, as, as a frontline treatment rather than a treatment of, of last resort. Uh, there's a lot of good early indication that um, immunotherapies could be way more effective, in fact, if they were given earlier, mm -hmm. before your immune system's been, uh, you know, effectively ablated by, you know, round after round of chemotherapy. Um, you know, imagine how successful some of these treatments could be if they were given up front um, rather than <clears throat> as a last resort. So hopefully, hopefully we, can, we can make some progress there. Turn it into more of a standard of care. Yeah, and, and, you know, and look, in, in, in indications like melanoma, it, it already is mm -hmm. effectively a standard of care, but, but, uh, but still not a frontline treatment. Got it. Denny, we know that you had type 1 diabetes on, on your wish list. Do you have anything, anything else on your wish list? Not necessarily for yourself, but what do you want to see happen in the field here? I really would like to, you know, the, a lot of the, the, the sessions here have been the speed of, of getting cures done and the like, and uh, I'm a big believer and supporter of consortium uh, organizations. We put together an, out in uh, La Jolla area a consortium consisting of the Scripps Institute, the Salk Institute, UC San Diego, uh, <coughs> La Jolla Immunology, and Sanford Burnham, five organizations that bring, bring all of their research on type 1 diabetes together and share and get away from the silo effect that, that just plagues uh, medical research in general. And uh, Sanford Health has done the same thing in genetics with children's hospitals. We now have 12 children's hospitals that, as opposed to duplicating and replicating what everyone else is doing, there's huge economies of scale together with great knowledge that's passed from one organization to another, and, and they just meet quarterly. And, and share what they can do. So I believe in collaboratories, if you will. Collabor uh, I like that, collaboratories. <laughs> yeah. Good, good, collaboration. Collaboratories. <laughs> We've heard, uh, Kelby, some of your personal wish list, obviously. Um, anything else, you think? Oh, so much has been covered, and it's almost the witching hour. I'd, uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say that the guy seated next to me refers to Sanford Health as though it was uh, a generic organization, and uh, that's for one reason. I asked him to use his name. It was the last thing I asked on the list of things that we wanted to do, because our name was Sioux Valley. There wasn't any <laughs> Sioux Indians left and <laughs> where we live, and the Dakotas uh, are as flat as a pancake, and so there was no valleys. It was a, <laughs> so I asked him, and we walked out the door, he didn't really concede to that one. He doesn't, he doesn't like the attention. He doesn't. He loves these social rooms. I'm going to talk about you for a second. Um, and he loves to be with people, obviously. But he doesn't like things named after him. He really is not that kind of guy. And I said, but I really need it for that reason. And he put his arm around my chief nursing officer at the time, walking to the door. And he simply said, all right. I guess I should be glad my name isn't Krabinoft. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's how I <laughs> But I'll tell you, it's a, it's a father-son thing, and it's, 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 it's built on uh, a vision, no question about it, and we share. But uh, it's founded on trust that he started his comments with you, Max. And, That'll go beyond our lifetimes, and I'm just so proud to be associated with him and everybody in this room. Thanks for what you're doing. It, it is God's work, so thank you. It is. It is, in fact. I, I think what you've heard today from these four really extraordinary gentlemen is that this is about a lot more 
than making a lot of money and then, and then giving it away. This is about their passion. This is about really wanting to make a difference in the human condition. And that is what they're doing, and that is why I think they all deserve an incredible round of applause.